Welcome to the sixth module of the course. Uh, this is the part one that we will start today. The sixth module will focus on the cognitive neuroscience of language. So, till now we have looked at the uh, language structure and the uh, various aspects of language structure and how it uh, connects both the cognitive apparatus as well as the social, social cognition and so on and so forth with respect to language learning as well. So, now we will move on to the brain. So, the neuroscience of language as far as uh, it is concerned, there have been there has been a lot of um, uh, contribution from neuroscience towards understanding the functions and representation of language in the brain. So, initially it was not, uh, it, it was primarily the contribution of neuroscientists that we uh, come to know about the various language centers, so called language centers in the brain and gradually things uh, changed and uh, now it is an interdisciplinary research domain. So, uh, let us go a bit to the historical aspect of how the brain has been seen over a period of time. Historically, if we go back in time, brain was not really considered very important. One of the ancient texts that go back to the 1700 BCE uh, that talks about the Egyptians practice of mummifying the body and it mentions that the brain used to be scooped out and discarded while mummifying, whereas the heart was preserved for afterlife, meaning that the brain was not considered important enough. Fast forward a bit, during the Greek times even Aristotle did not give as much of importance to brain as he gave to the heart. He placed heart at the top of the hierarchy of all the bodily organs and but placed brain at a lower level and in a, in a position to, uh, to cool the uh, blood as a kind of a radiator. So, the oldest uh, 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 mention of the position of brain is concerned as far as it is concerned in the we go back to the go back to uh, Greek philo Greek uh, uh, physician Hippocrates who is also considered the father of uh, modern medicine in the western world. So, he is the per first person who is credited with giving the brain its due position within the hierarchy of the bodily organs and interestingly also it is Hippocrates who placed uh, who, who said who, who for the first time dissociated diseases from religion. Earlier it was considered that religion diseases are caused by some kind of a curse by the gods and so on. However, Hippocrates was the person who, uh, who said that diseases are caused by certain, um, certain, certain uh, elements in the lifestyle, food and so on. So, uh, that is the, so he is credited with all these contributions to understanding the human body and its uh, afflictions including the brain. In the modern times uh, in, in the European tradition, it was in the 1600s that William Willis, uh, Thomas Willis, um, a pioneering physician in Oxford who through a series of experiments found out that there are a, there is a series of uh, you know um, uh, series of forces that constant force that courses through our nervous system which is responsible for our perception, thought, feeling, memories and so on. So, there is a something that is happening through the something that is running through the nervous system which is related to all these mental functions. So, this is this is one of the oldest findings that uh, relates um, the nervous system with the mental functions. By the end of 1700s, this uh, this um, had a name. The force that goes through the nervous system was given a name by Galvani. Uh, so Galvani called uh, said that this is actually a, a kind of an electric impulse. And then fast forward a little bit more, we have Franz Joseph Gall, who is the father of phrenology. So what is phrenology? Phrenology is a school of thought. We have uh, we did talk about it in the very beginning while we talked about the background of cognitive science from neuroscientific perspective. So uh, phrenology was basically a kind of a school of thought that said that the brain has localized functions. So for, uh, there is a local area, there is an area, a particular area responsible for various kinds of mental functions. So this is a very uh, strong localization hypothesis 
hypothesis that says that um, the various functions in the brain are localized in certain areas. Now, this was 1796 and at that time there was uh, the brain scans were not uh, yet in place. So, what uh, Joseph Gall set out to do is he, he ascribed the size of the skull depending on the area in the on the skull that represents the uh, area beneath it wa was considered to be an indicator of the function. So, shape of the skull deciding the nature of a person. So, elements of personality and mental ability were mapped onto the brain by Gall in this particular method. So, this is one of the uh, representative pictures that uh, that shows how phrenology really works. So, you can see that there are various areas in the brain basically mapped on the skull, um, so which represents various kinds of mental functions. Phrenology went out of fashion after some time, because it was not uh, quite scientifically tenable, because uh, it was already found out that it is not strong localization pattern probably is not a good idea to talk about mental functions, because there is a lot of connectivity that happens, um, lot of connectivity that is required for any simple mental function. So, that was the time of a lot of activities in the uh, in neuroanatomy, neurosurgery and so on. And then we go on to the next, um, the biggest, uh, the, this is uh, the biggest possible name in neuroscience, the father of modern neuroscience, Santiago Ramon Cajal. So, his uh, drawings are, um, are, are the first ones that show how the brain actually works, how the neuronal structure really is. At that time, there was no fine uh, machinery available to him. So, what he did was he he his, he he was all, he was not only a neuroscientist; he was also a very good um, uh, painter. He was also a very good artist. So, this is one of his most famous drawings. Um, all his drawings are, of course, preserved in Kahal Institute. So, this this drawing shows that the neurons are there. There are there are groups of neurons, and the neurons are not connected to each other. They are discrete the discrete units of function and they are not connected to each other. There is a slight gap between um, uh, two neurons and the impulses, the electric impulses that, that is a signal that pass from one neuron to another. And he also proposed that the signal is uh, the starts at the dendrites and exits, it enters to the dendrites and exits through the um, axons. This is how he, uh, he, he postulated and this is uh, later called, this was later called neuron doctrine that there is a gap between the between the neurons which later was called synapses and that they are not connected so uh, at that time because it was um, uh, it was very difficult to really um, uh, objectively through a machine to look at it and there was a lot of skepticism however it was proved to be true all his predictions all his studies all his uh, calculations were con were, were uh, found out to be uh, absolutely true when electron microscope were, uh, was uh, uh, came to place but in any case, the most important uh, contribution of Kahal is the study of uh, brain at the neuronal level and their structure and to show that there is a connection that, that happens. So, he departed from the earlier held view around that time the fashion the, the, the most um, uh, uh, held, uh, commonly held view was that the brain works like a connected network of a sort of a net sort of a thing which is fused together. But however, uh, this was Kahal's contribution was that they are not fused together, they of course work together, but they are not connected together, they are there is a gap between them. So, and then in the 20th century of course, uh, this was 1889 and by the time we come to 20th century, we see a lot of progress in this domain, a lot of progress in terms of uh, two things. First and foremost was that interdisciplinary research begins to take place in a very, very strong way. We have already seen that 1940s, 1950s saw a lot of activities in, in, in neurosciences, in artificial intelligence, in cognitive sciences and so on. And that is when the scientists from all these fields came together and thereby the field got immensely enriched. So, now linguistics and neuroscience and cognitive science and artificial intelligence join hand together. So, this led to a significant development in the understanding of human brain with respect to the various language functions and so on. Another important development that happened around this time was the new techniques that came into being. There was, there was a lot of development in devising newer and newer methods to 
uh, look at the brain not only in terms of structure, but also in terms of function. So, not only earlier methods were um, the time at the time of Kahal and others, they were looking at the brain of other animals most of the time and sometimes they would uh, they would also dissect the, the you know the dead person's brain in their own uh, laboratory and in a, in a very uh, from today's perspective it looks rather rudimentary way. But now we have uh, state of the art machinery that looks at the brain as it is functioning right you know online in a, in a, in, a, in its dynamic fashion as it is processing some information and so on. So, we do not really have to uh, depend on those techniques anymore. So, these are the two things that happen in 20th century part of which we have already discussed in the introduction a lot of active a lot of scientific uh, developments took place at this time and that is how uh, and that is how the uh, latest knowledge system and uh, latest knowledge about this field actually um, uh, generated. So, there will be the, this, this module we will be looking at the structure of the brain, the various um, you know ways of ways of categorizing the various domains of the brain and then we will look at the uh, various kinds of language disorders that have that were the precursor of language studies in the brain with respect to the brain and so on. So, we will start with the structure of the brain. Now, the brain there are certain fundamental things about human brain. One is that like all vertebrates human brain is arranged contralaterally, what, may we, what that means is that the brain has two hemispheres. However, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, which is not the way in invertebrates. Invertebrates it is lateral like right side right brain controls the right side of the body, left, left brain controls the left side of the body. So, contralaterality is a very significant uh, diff, um, aspect of human brain like all heart, uh, vertebrates. Another uh, important crucial feature about human um, brain physiology is that like other uh, unlike other paired organs like uh, you know the lungs and other, other paired organs, the two hemispheres have distinct functions which is not the case for other paired organs. So, um, uh, both the lungs function the same way, both the kidneys function the same way and so on, but the both the hemispheres of the human brain do have distinct functions. So, they have separate um, uh, ways of working. So, that is why brain functions are uh, hemispheric brain functions are called asymmetrical. These are the two important things uh, that are important to remember as we go ahead. So, the right hemisphere apart from um, controlling the left side of the body, it also controls the spatial acuity, the awareness of position in space. So, as you move, move in space, the brain does keep a map of the movement in space and position of, of yourself in um, at all times in all, all directions simultaneously. Similarly, the left hemisphere in addition to controlling the right side of the body also controls abstract reasoning, physical task which requires step by step progression and so on. And for us what is more important is that the left hemisphere also controls language. So, these are the fundamental building blocks on which we will move on now. Organization of the brain areas. Now, brain organization of the brain areas has been as we have seen already that going back to the days of phrenology, phrenology the, there have been various ways of ap, you know, approaching the same question as to which part of the brain does what you know how is the brain organized in terms of structure as well as in terms of function. So, there have been various um, the various uh, you know um, various uh, ways of looking at it. So, the most fundamental thing is one of the fundamental uh, ways of organizing understanding the organization of the brain is a gyral sulcal organization. What does this mean is that the brain is not it is it is folded it is convoluted the structure of the brain is convoluted. It is like you, you just you know, scrunch together a net sort of a thing and then um, you know put it into a put it into a small box that is what the brain will be uh, in, in some sense. So, there will be some raised part there will be some um, parts like this. So, this is basically how it is when you have folded it. So, this is how it looks. So, the raised parts this is called gyrus and this is the sulcus this is how it goes I mean the whole entire brain is like this. So, the top part is called gyrus and this is so gyral sulcal organization is one of the uh, basic organizational uh, aspect of the brain. 
So, why uh, uh, while we have this kind of a convoluted structure that is a very, um, uh, very important aspect to it, because by having this kind of a structure it helps mean it helps um, minimizing a lot of surface area. Imagine the, if the brain was opened uh, you know uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, its, in, a, in a flat surface uh, that, that would um, you can imagine what would happen. So, this is basically um, uh, because of the because of the folded structure of the brain because of the convoluted structure of the brain it has a very small three dimensional uh, volume. So, as much as two third of the cortex lies within the sulci. So, this is uh, two third of this is this is the part. So, this parts these uh, sulcus sulcus is the uh, singular and sulci is the plural. So, this two third of the brain uh, cortical area that is the surface area of the brain lies in the sulci. So, also this reduces the am, uh, amount of axonal wiring needed in order to uh, uh, in order for the conduction of signals. And although some major sulci and gyri are present in all humans, their shape and size differs. So, most even though there is a universal sort of an universality across human brains, but there are sometimes some differences uh, in the shape and size, which is genetically influenced. So, this is the size gyral sulcal organization. Another way of looking at uh, the brain organization is what is called the cytoarchitectonic organization. This organization depends on the presence or absence of and packing density and layering of various cells. So, basically how the, the anatomical uh, aspect of the brain. So, a in a tiny area of the brain how much of brain cells are there, how are they packed, what is the den density and uh, which cells are present, which cells are absent and so on that is one aspect. Another aspect is the um, functional layers also. So, cortex is almost, so basically the cortex is the top part of the brain. So, this cortical region has six layers, it is like some something uh, this is this is how it actually looks if you take a. So, this is a tiny part of the brain that can be that can if you if you have a if you have, if you dissect it this is how it will look. So, there are these uh, one two, six layers and each layer as you can see there is there are different kinds of uh, structure as well as connections are also different for each layer. So, each layer is characterized not only by the morphology that is the structure of the cells within it, but also by their connectional properties. Each layer has a different connectional um, structure connectional property. So, layer 1, 2, 3 that is the top 3 layers communicate with other cortical areas that is uh, you know other uh, outside of that and the layer uh, 4 receives input from the thalamus, layer 5 sends output to subcortical areas that is the uh, areas under the cortical area and layer 6 sends output to thalamus. So, you can see even within a tiny area like this and it has 6 layers, uh, 6 um, a vertical layers and then each layer has it has a different function altogether. So, when you are looking at the brain in terms of this kind of a structure this is called cytoarchitectonic structure. So, perpendicular to these horizontal layers are vertical columns measuring 0.5 mm and consist of roughly 100 neurons and these columns are considered the basic functional units of the cortex. So, this is uh, uh, the functional um, in, in, in a way the more with the basic functional units of the brain. So, then we go on to another important um, way of uh, structuring a uh, way of organizing the brain that is uh, we, we, we are now move on to Corbinian Broadman. Broadman's areas are uh, still used, he used he, he published his findings in 1909 and they are still used mu much of his findings much of his areas Corbinian uh, Broadman areas are still in used after some revisions. So, he was a German neurologist, he drew a map of the uh, a drawing of the lateral and medial view of the brain and segregated it into 43 cortical areas. Initially, he had of course, it was not only human brain that he dissected, he had dissected a lot of other mammals brains as well and then he uh, decided that there are all these areas in the brain, uh, which some of them do, do correspond to human brain as well, some of them do not. So, ultimately he um, came out with this 43 cortical areas, later on some revisions happened. So, these are his areas have been updated many times recently based on obviously, uh, latest technology and so on, but uh, many are still uh, many are still utilized many are still understood to be valid. So, this is um, a map 
uh, from uh, this is how the Corbin uh, Broadman's map looks like. There are many many of these areas. So it is um, so you can see area 22 is area 22 is primary auditory cortex uh, here, and then this is the uh, Broca's area and primary motor cortex. So these are the areas that we will be uh, talking about when we talk about language functions. So auditory cortex, visual. Um, and then this is motor cortex and of course, the visual cortex. So, and then there is Wernicke's area, these are the most important areas as far as language is concerned. Also, there are many others that he has given. So, this is a kind of a list that Broadman's areas, uh, which area refers to what. So, 1, 2, 3 will be primary somatosensory uh, cortex and so on. So, basically Broadman's areas are uh, referring to various um, uh, uh, local local areas within the brain on the surface of the brain that is responsible for certain functions. So, this is again a functional organization of the human brain. And then there is of course, connectional organization brain uh, though there are struct there are areas localized um, uh, localization of certain functions in the brain, but as we know today already and as we have also talked about in the introduction that of course, there are areas that are responsible primarily for certain functions if not exclusively and but the functioning of the human brain depends on connections and networking across domains. So, the structural areas do not operate in isolation, they depend on a massively interconnected network giving rise to complex neural functions. So, dynamic uh, cooperative interplay of signals carried by bundles of axons coursing through pathways along the white matter is basically what it depends on, what this connection depends on. So, this is kind of a highway in the human brain and of course, the biggest uh, the, and the busiest, the most, uh, most well known uh, pathway fiber tract, so to say in the human brain is the corpus callosum that connects the hemispheres. In the, uh, in the 1940s, as we have already talked about, there have been lot of you know new developments, lot of new uh, studies, a lot of new discoveries that have happened. One of them were the radical brain surgeries. What happened? Many of the brain surgeries that were required at that time in the earlier times were due to epilepsy. For most of these surgeries took place on epileptic patients. So, one of the one of the surgical interventions was to cutting the corpus callosum. Now, what happens if you cut the corpus callosum which connects the both hemispheres? automatically what will happen is that the brain the hemispheres will not be able to uh, communicate with each other they will be uh, as if they are separate entities. So, as a result of which what we have what we call technically is split brain pressions. So, that is when this due, due to this kind of surgical interventions due to this kind of um, uh, machinations that helped researchers gain a lot of um, a lot of a lot of understanding and insight into the individual properties of the hemispheres in isolation. Remember that was a time when uh, uh, the technical sophistication was still making its way and we still so we still could not really technically today we can uh, put to sleep so to say a particular part of the brain and check the working of the other side of the brain. But at that time how it actually started was due to epileptic uh, surgeries on epileptic brain patients. So, the, how the individual hemisphere works in absence of the connection to the other hemisphere that data comes from uh, cutting of corpus callosum in epileptic patients. So, uh, now, let us uh, after this brief introduction, let us move on to what is our uh, our concern, which is the areas related to language functions in the brain. So, these are called language centers. So, there are uh, parts of the uh, there are parts of the brain, the cortical regions that are responsible for language uh, production and language understanding and so on. They are called the language areas. But apart from that, there are also other areas as we have seen language is not a function in isolation language whether it is uh, within the brain or outside the brain it is always a connection of various things. So, even within inside the brain when language function does take place there is a language area that also connects to other cortical regions primarily those cortical regions are the auditory cortex, visual cortex and the motor cortex. Obviously, this is understood this is quite an easy to understand visual cortex because our most more often than not our language 
learning and uh, a, a serious amount of language learning a serious amount of language uh, processing the way we use language depends on the written aspect of it written and um, uh, through reading and writing through reading and writing uh, constitute a large amount of language use for us. So, that is why visual cortex auth automatically gets involved. So, visual cortex plays a very important role in terms of language functions, language processing. Similarly, the auditory cortex because our spoken language is dependent on the auditory uh, spoken loop and because mo motor cortex is again a very very crucial. This is upper middle of each hemisphere responsible for sending signals to muscles including jaw, face and other places. So, the tongue to produce language to be able to speak. So, motor cortex controls the motor activity of the body which includes production of language. Similarly, visual cortex is in the lower uh, back of each hemisphere. So, this is where the visual occipital area is and uh, so and this, this part particular part of the cortical region it receives and interprets visual stimuli and is thought to be storing images. So, as we have just uh, talked about language is often dependent on reading and writing. So, this is where the part of um, the visual cortex uh, the, the, the participatory action of visual cortex is important for language functions. Apart from this, these three cortical regions there are two more areas um, that are considered primarily language areas, one of them is Broca's area, the other is called Wernicke's area. Broca's area is located at the, this is where Broca's area is and um, Wernicke's area should be mentioned here, 2239, this is, uh, this is Wernicke's area and uh, so these are the two uh, most important uh, areas uh, which respect, with respect to uh, which are called primary language areas. So, Broca's area is at the uh, base of the motor cortex which is why um, we, we, Broca's area has certain typical um, uh, types, certain typical uh, uh, problems associated with it. So, this is responsible for organizing the articulatory patterns of language and directing the motor cortex when we want to talk. This area also controls use of inflections like tense marking, number marking, gender marking and so on, function morphemes like determiners and prepositions and so on. Recent research has also found evidence of involvement of this area in comprehension as well, not only in production of language, but also in comprehension. And Wernicke's area is located near the back section of the auditory cortex. This part is involved primarily in comprehension of words. Um, and selection of words when producing sentences. So, these are the primary uh, regions in the brain which are considered responsible for uh, uh, language representation as well as language processing. Though it is not um, without much without controversy nowadays there is a lot of disagreement and the latest findings suggest some more additions and some, uh, some changes in the earlier held view, but this is still roughly the uh, this is still where we are. These are the primary areas which are considered responsible. Of course, now we also include the executive function network and so on. So, before we move on to the aphasia and other studies, let us just talk about the methods a bit because um, this is how we have got the data. This is what we will be talking about. So, let us talk about the tool through which you got the data. As we have been uh, mentioning uh, from the uh, in the introduction as well as today, we have talked about there are a lot of data in brain uh, uh, brain studies with respect to language as to where the language is located, how language functions are carried out, which part of the brain does what and so on. All these data primarily were derived from the patients of various types. So, because either they are uh, not they are some kind of a brain damage has taken place due to certain kinds of accidents or disease or so on and sometimes some kind of a uh, also neurodegeneration. So, basically some amount of there was a this was a clinical intervention as opposed to a research intervention. So, basically primarily in the initial stages all the data came from patients as we have seen that machinery the fine tuned sophisticated machinery uh, has come into uh, has, has been available to researchers only recently. And even today it is not uh, so easy to get a healthy person to uh, go through all kinds of brain mapping mechanisms 
voluntarily uh, and it has to be voluntary obviously. So, it is still at a, at a nascent stage. So, a large amount of data that we have come from brain damaged patients. So, here is a that is why there is a, uh, way, uh, a word of caution here that brain damage is always bad for you, but if you are lucky it will be um, bad for you in a theoretically interesting way. So, this basically captures the essence of the, uh, of, the, of, the of the field. So, let us go back a little bit again history. Uh, so, Dr. John Fulton worked for two years with a patient named Walter K who suffered from severe headaches and visual disturbances at the same time. And uh, why this happened? Because he is this person had a large uh, collection of abnormal blood vessels carrying uh, overlying his occipital cortex that is where the visual cortex is. So, occipital cortex uh, the he this person had an a large amount of brain uh, a large amount of blood vessels on the occipital cortex of this brain as a result of which he had not only headache, but he also had visual disturbances. Now, when blood courses through these vessels intensely, it created a pulsating sound that he could even hear, he could hear as if some kind of a humming sound is, is there and the patient could hear that sound. Even the doctor could hear it with the uh, with his stethoscope. So, that was the kind that was heavy blood flow that uh, happened during those uh, through those uh, areas. Now, through a series of carefully designed experiments, uh, the doctor discovered that the blood flow and the resultant sound were correlated not just with his heartbeat, but also with his visual experiences. Today, it seems commonsensical because we already know certain things as basic, but at that time this was a remarkable finding that the more the blood flow of course, there was a sound effect to it because he could hear the uh, resultant sound through his stethoscope even the person could the patient himself could hear a humming sound, but he also experienced visual disturbances. So, the, the amount of blood flow that kept fluctuating also kept disturbing his visual uh, sensation to a large extent. So, these were the first compelling uh, evidence that regionally specific blood flow can have can alter our uh, a neural activity in that particular area. So, regionally um, specific changes in blood flow reflects regionally specific neural activity. So, there is a correlation that blood flow can is correlated with activity at the neuronal level. These are one of the first pointers to that aspect. In fact, this is why this, this is the fundamental premise on which a lot of methods are based today. So, what we um, uh, the what are the primary um, primary goals, primary aims of the neuropsychology uh, research is with respect to uh, language is that there are this is there is a two way approach to it. One is that it tries to determine which components of the language faculty can be selectively disrupted as to where the where the language faculties are uh, you know uh, positioned and that can be disrupted separately uh, distinctly. This relates mainly to understand the cognitive architecture of language as to how it is really represented and how it really works. And secondly to identify the reliable link between language deficit and brain uh, lesion specific deficit. So, if there is a brain uh, an anatomical problem with the brain and there is a correlation with language deficit. So, is the what kind of a language disorder is connected to which kind of lesion brain lesion. So, that is the second uh, thing and both of these are of course, connected. So, both this type of research um, as I said are connected they go hand in hand because once the, there is a brain damage there will be a say resultant language uh, disability and then depending on which area that is you can know how the cognitive architecture of language really works. So, the implication of these studies not only have theoretical outputs towards um, understanding of language mind brain, but also it helps us clinically in clinical research as to how to diagnose and probably treat language impairment. In fact, this is a big area of research now as to uh, both in terms of um, atypical children, atypical population as well as brain damaged um, uh, patients to restore their linguistic capacity or to at least improve the linguistic capacity. So, these are very important first steps towards go that goal, not only in a theoretical way, but also in a practical way in an appli the applica application aspect of it is also very, very significant. 
So, the two there are two kinds of data um, the, that are typically that, are, that uh, researchers typically work with they are called dissociation work and dissociation uh, data say neuropsychological data uh, of dissociations there are two kinds of dissociation single and double. The single dissociation basically refers to a scenario when a patient is administered two different tasks okay, and he performs worse in one compared to the other. So, let us say a patient who suffers from a brain damage in a particular area of the brain and he cannot name objects, but he can uh, easily identify actions. So, basically the nouns are uh, impaired, but the words are perfect. So, this will be a single dissociation only one person having one uh, problem in the in uh, one uh, physiological problem and then one kind of a language disorder. So, what will be uh, the inference? The patient's lesion has selectively disrupted that particular activity, that particular linguistic activity, which he has uh, not been able to do properly. So, and then uh, not by the better performed one. So, the this particular, so you map the lesion site and the um, uh, disability in language task and say that because of this particular um, damage, the damage in this particular region, he has this particular pro particular problem. So, this is the uh, uh, this is what is called single dissociation. Now, the problem with this is that uh, though it sounds simply simple enough, the problem there is a problem. What if the tasks are not um, you know generalized? How, what if the tasks are not uh, similarly uh, designed? So, what if uh, you know there is a patient's patient might has abnormal sensitivity towards one aspect of language as opposed to another. For example, many of us might be good in you know creating a metaphorical understanding metaphors, but not so good in understanding other figurative speech of, uh, part, parts of speech or so on and so forth even at the simple level. So, we might be doing well in better better with nouns as opposed to verbs and so on. So, what if the patient himself has some uh, pre uh, decided such kind of an abnormality in, in uh, language functions that is one problem and second could be mm, the task may not be balanced. So, for example, what we mean by uh, task may not be balanced, suppose you give a picture naming task to a patient where he has to name objects versus actions, so thus noun versus verbs and he performs better in one and compared to the other this would be a single dissociation, but what if the nouns were longer like orang utang and the verbs were sh shorter like walk and so on. So, this is there are uh, these are some of the problems, but there are many other uh, also that has been that have been um, pointed out. On the other hand, you have double dissociation. Double dissociation happens when there are two patients instead of one and they have two diametrically opposed patterns of performance on two different tasks. So, there are person 1 and person 2, person um, 2 A and B and one person does well in noun, another person does well in uh, verb based tasks and they have two different kinds of brain lesion. Now, you superimpose one on the other and you see that because they have different patterns of brain lesion and different patterns of uh, language uh, difficulty. So, this could be a better way of looking at the connection between lesion sites and the resultant language function. So, this is what is called a double dissociation. So, this uh, this is what we have already uh, discussed. So, and but how do we how do we have language deficit? What are the reasons for having language deficit? One of the reasons we have been talking about is epilepsy. That is uh, that has been uh, one of the reasons that uh, epileptic patients have sometimes uh, exhibited uh, problems with language. But otherwise, why do we have problems? So these are the most common reasons for having ling language deficits. Stroke. It is very common when uh, after a stroke, um, the patients sometimes permanently sometimes uh, for a short period of time they will lose the ability um, certain linguistic ability if not entirely. So, stroke is one then either open head or closed head uh, traumatic brain injury neurodegenerative and infectious diseases and of course, tumors neurodegenerative diseases happens when um, at an uh, advanced stage, but others can happen any time. So, these are typically the reasons why we um, that are connected to language deficit. These are some technicalities of analyzing lesion deficit uh, correlation as to as we have already seen that there is a deformity in terms of language function and there is a problem with the brain structure in terms of some injury or something and then there is a um, uh, overlap and 
as a result of a subtraction analysis. So, superimposed um, uh, lesion sites of patients with a with, with uh, particular deficit is contrasted with the superimposed lesion sites of patients without that specific problem. So, you match with the patient, uh, one patient who has the problem, one patient who has not who does not have the problem and then you um, from, from there you can decide as to which particular kind of lesion has resulted in this kind of a language problem. Similarly, there is a voxel ma uh, voxel based lesion symptom map ma mapping for each voxel the behavioral performance of the patients with damage at that particular locus is statistically compared with those without the damage at that locus. So, there is that that in fact gives us a lot more um, precision uh, with respect to the results. So, it indicates the degree to which the damage in so the degree is very crucial and the damage in particular region disrupts specific ability. So, at the at a level of uh, at, a, at a voxel level that understanding goes. So, and then then this depending on this kind of techniques there are various kinds of tools that are used today. Uh, these were not available to researchers some, fi some 50, 60 years back. So, today we have all these various kinds of brain mapping techniques that are also used for research purposes um, along with of course, clinical purposes. So, they are of different types, one is called the functional neuroimaging, the other is electrophysiology and then of course, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So, functional neuroimaging all of us are uh, aware of MRIs. Um, and then there is uh, uh, MRI and then of course, we have PET and then electrophysiology is a different type of uh, 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 mach machinery altogether. But uh, before we go on to the nice colorful pictures of what these machines give us, there is a word of caution of course, that there is also a, a scope of human error and you know there is there is there is a lot of um, this thing this should be taken with a uh, spoon of um, uh, salt let us say. So, as uh, it is said that it is dangerously seductive this kind of functional neuroimaging data is dangerously seductive because it combines the prestige of serious science with broad appeal of images. So, what we see ultimately the results of these machines are images that are that that seems to be the final word. However, it is important to remember that these images are results of processing multiple layers of processing in fact and statistical analysis and as a result of which we see what we see. And so, there are and as a result of which these are dependent on lot of assumptions. So, there is a statistics uh, that is coming into here and that is also the image processing part of it and the, the assumptions on which those calculations are carried out are not always uncontroversial. There, there are some, uh, some debates are there. So, there is, so this cannot be this, there is a little risk there that we must keep in mind. So, anyway functional neuroimaging has two different kinds of um, uh, techniques, one is called positron emission tomography which is PET. What it basically does is that it tracks the distribution of a radio uh, active isotope through the blood vessel. So, the blood vessel as it go blood as it courses through the brain the, uh, the machine tracks the radioactive isotope as it moves around in the brain. So, where in the brain it goes and how is the activity happening and so on that is what it picks up. On the other hand fMRI picks up the uh, bold signal which is blood oxygen level dependent signal basically it talks about that area of the brain where you have larger amount of blood flow which will also have larger amount of oxygen level. So, that is what the uh, fMRI machine picks up and this uh, function typically this uh, in both cases the function will typically last for only a few seconds because the patients um, cannot be put through that uh, thing for a, for a long period of time. So, the data that comes from is, is for 10 to 12 uh, seconds. So, this is how the machine looks in both cases fMRI and PET machines look similar and these are the, the output that we see. So, in um, the first picture is that of this is a PET um, output, this is an fMRI output. So, that you can see that when uh, that is uh, when the person speaks these are the areas that are getting um, uh, you know uh, more oxygen. Getting more oxygen means getting more blood flow and we have already seen that higher blood flow is connected to higher neural activity. So, this if you have more uh, blood flow in these these regions that means these are the areas of the brain that are active when a person is speaking. Now, depending on what kind of speech, what kind of 
which aspect of the language is being looked at that we that will give us the uh, that that will take us to the uh, particular um, specific problem of that study. However, this basically shows that this area is more active and not only one area as you can see so many areas are simultaneously active whereas, finger tap only activates this particular region. So, this is basically uh, listening this. So, what do we what do we mean by all this is that these are the areas. So, whether it is the isotope or it is the oxygen level these are the regions where more blood flow was noticed while the person did something while the person was processing some amount of information or just given a simple thing like a finger tapping or listening to something and so on and so forth. So, this is an indirect way of understanding the brain's activity, brain's mechanism. The indirect, why indirect? Because we are dependent on the level of blood flow to that particular region. This is an indirect method because we do not know what the brain is actually doing. All we know that it is active. It is active because it has gotten more blood flow and as a result of which we get this kind of signals. So, the basic principle underlying these uh, machines is the amount of blood flow as we have just seen to a certain brain region and that is the uh, marker of activity. So, higher blood flow marks higher activity in that particular region and in fact, this has also been dramatically called as a vampire theory because it is dependent on blood uh, more blood to support the higher metabolism increased metabolism. So, thus blood flow is associated with neural activity uh, and that is what these methods are dependent on and because it is dependent on blood flow it is called hemodynamic method. Now, next method is um, electrophysiology. Now, neither PET or fMRI scan measures brain activity directly as we have seen that we only have the understanding of the metabolic functions consequences of the brain activity. In contrast, we have electrophysiological techniques that bring us much closer to neuronal firing. This is a word that is constantly used in neurosciences firing that is the activation level of the neuronal uh, network that is called firing. So, this electrophysiological techniques are take us closer to that activity uh, in because it picks up the signal directly. So, sometimes these techniques involve stimulating certain brain parts of the uh, certain parts of the exposed brain and observing the effect on cognition and behavior directly as we will just see. The other technique is recording electrical signals of neuron as they unfold. So, there are two kinds of electrophysiological technique one is picking up the signals from outside the scalp and as, as, as it is as the brain is busy doing some work it picks up the electrical signal. The other kind is that uh, one the specific brain area specific uh, areas within the uh, of the cortex can be um, electrically stimulated and then we can check the um, check whatever happens in terms of if, uh, cognition and behavior. So, this is one such uh, case where direct electrical stimulation. So, this was first performed in long back in the 19th century by Penfield. Um, he mapped functional organization of exposed cortex as we have already seen that it that this was a co common practice it still is a common practice for epileptic surgeries. So, in the in the exposed part of the cortex for uh, epileptic patients he uh, he tried and he he he, uh, he applied electrical stimulation to certain areas uh, where he has to do the operation to see if language function gets disrupted. Uh, so, that 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 area can be uh, protected and while while doing the surgery the, because the idea was as a result of epilepsy surgery the person should not lose his capacity to speak also. So, language ability must not be lost as a result of the surgery. So, on one instance when an electrode was introduced into the cortex of the superior surface a particular region of the temporal lobe and a gentle current this current is extremely of a very low um, a very low intensity and the current was switched on the patient exclaimed oh a familiar memory in an office somewhere and so on it goes on like this. So, a particular brain region which is activated which is stimulated by an external agent through current the person says that he is you know he, he suddenly he activates some memory of a of a thing of a of a of a, of a, of a particular event that that happened. Similarly, for so this kind of research was going on for uh, during that time. So, following him another uh, study that uh, took place on this kind of similar kind of patients uh, was carried out by John John Wojeman 
and he found uh, he actually this this research actually gave rise to some landmark studies using on language. So, what the protocol was there will be line drawings basically pictures pictures not in detail, but only in outline. So, the drawings of familiar objects were projected on the screen and they had to just say this kind of a sentence this is a and then whatever was there. So, this is there they are given a, a matrix sentence this is a and whatever appeared they have to name it. There were the, the number of data number of participants was very high 117 patients and um, on the onset of the some of the slides the experimenters stimulated some points in the cortex before they would uh, uh, they would speak certain areas of the cortex was um, uh, was stimulated electrically. And then this is how it was uh, and, and this was uh, repeated thrice and the response was uh, uh, recorded. So, what the findings shows that what they were trying to see is which are the brain areas that are responsible for production of speech to name naming how which area is uh, responsible for naming. So, what they found out was that in a vast majority of cases uh, stimulation disrupted naming only in few discrete. So, as they were beginning to speak and the certain areas were stimulated electrically and that disrupted the speech, but um, in 67 percent of patients two or more such sites were detected right. There were two or more sites not only one site for naming there were two or more sites and uh, one in the frontal cortex and one in the temporal or parietal cortex. Basically what they found was that there is not one area there are more than one areas in the brain for responsible for naming and also that there were inter subject differences. So, uh, there was a lot of variability across subjects not every person had the exact same uh, location for the exact same function. So, this was one of the earliest findings of um, direct cortical stimulation. Then there is intracranial recording this is used to measure neural activity at the level of single cell which is even more precise, uh, but more often they are used at the level of cell assemblies. One method is called the electrocorticography this involves placing high density multi electrode grid this is how it looks now in the exposed cortex in a very tiny area this is a representative picture not a real uh, uh, human. So, the in the exposed cortex in a very very tiny area there will be a grid of electrodes that is placed and that picks up the, um, the, the signals and so the it, it measures the local field potential of cell assemblies that can be measured at sub centimeter spatial resolution and millisecond temporal resolution. So, as it is within a uh, sub centimeter uh, region and the temporal temporal uh, resolution is at the level of milliseconds. So, as something as any activity goes on the signal the, the signals are picked up. So, while the per patient performs various linguistic tasks the grid picks up very very precise signals from that particular location. So, this is electrocorticography this is yet another this is an invasive technique this is yet another uh, um, uh, machine that 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 is that that is targeting the exposed cortex. So, inside intracranial inside the cranial. Now, we move on to extracranial recording extracranial recording refers to the recording that happens from outside the cranium. So, the skull is not opened it is still closed and we are picking up the signals from outside the skull. So, this is again a representative picture of how it looks. So, this one of the machines is called electroencephalography EEG. EEG is these days um, very uh, is used a lot for language related research this picks up the signals as the as the event unfolds as the person as the subject is carrying out some kind of an activity linguistic activity whether it is comprehension or production or any other task sometimes even non linguistic task the 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 cap which has lot of electrodes attached to it this basically picks up the signal as it is happening as it is unfolding in real time. So, this picks up event related potentials event related potentials as in as a result of some amount of stimulus something that has that the person is doing and that is picked up and then it is um, uh, in various dim dimensions of latency amplitude priority and so on and so forth. So, basically the signal is picked up by the tiny electric electrical signals are picked up by this machine and 
um, ampli amplified and projected on a screen and the output data is like a sine wave and that is what the data is and which, uh, which, uh, which is then analyzed. Yet another, uh, yet another uh, technique that uh, tool that we have today is transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is also an extracranial method, this does not uh, does not have to open the skull. This alters the organization of neural activity in a target cortical area by projecting a magnetic field through the overlying skull. So, there is a magnetic field that is created on top of the skull and by thereby it changes the neural activity in that particular region. So, the temporal resolution is again in terms of milliseconds spatial is in millimeters also very very accurate and very very precise. So, it mainly depends on the frequency of pulses and so on. So, these are some of the technical sophistication that we have today on the basis of which we get our data which uh, inter in the in the region of brain and language relationship. Now, we can move on to the um, actual research that took place with respect to locating brain uh, language in the brain. The first uh, study on language disorder uh, in terms of aphasia goes back um, a lot of uh, a long long time. So, the first writings on this link actually goes back to 5th century BC, but scientific research in, ter in terms of aphasia started only recently even though we have some reference to language loss and uh, brain damage being connected in the 5th century BC, but uh, more uh, more um, precise and more scientific way of looking at the research started only in 19th century. So, in 1836 Mark Dax described an association between aphasia, aphasia as in language disorder and disease of the left hemisphere. This is the this is uh, where he wrote it, but he never published and nor he did he present his study. The he, he titled the paper lesions of the left hemisphere coinciding with forgetfulness of science of thought. He never published as a result of which we have we now associate uh, the language uh, physical research starting with Carl um, with Broca. His son uh, however, uh, Gustav brought out this paper to light after Broca published a lot of uh, a series of studies in this. So, it is because Broca was the first person Paul Broca was the first person to report evidence in print. He is credited with the discovery that we speak with our left hemisphere. Paul Broca's uh, contribution towards uh, aphasia studies is enormous where he, uh, he looked at a particular patient who could speak, who could utter only a few sounds and later on after his death, eventual death, he, uh, he, he did, he, he studied the brain of the person and then found out that person had a lesion in the left hemisphere in a particular region, which later on came to be known as Broca's area, which is responsible for language uh, production. So, this is how he correlated them that this, because of a lesion in this particular area, this person had a uh, speech difficulty, he could not utter words, which later on was called Broca's area. And because of his contribution, we know this as Broca's aphasia, even though he was not the first person to talk about, to, to find this out. So, soon other scientists followed in his footstep and in the late 1800s, Carl Wernicke systematically explored other forms of aphasia as well. So, Broca started uh, uh, actually, uh, he, he opened the floodgate of studies in aphasia. So, there is uh, Broca's aphasia and then Carl Wernicke uh, talks about um, Wernicke's aphasia. He published a monograph documenting a new type of aphasia and, um, and he also predicted the existence of many others. So, Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia and little gradually we come to know that there are many others ki other kinds of aphasia. Aphasia basically refers to a uh, problem with either production or understanding of speech. So, Broca's aphasia for example, is like this. So, this is um, you know, today, today we have a lot of um, uh, test batteries that, uh, that uh, pinpoints the exact problem with the language. So, there are, there are various diagnostic uh, tools, one of them is called Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Examination, which basically has a picture, uh, a scene basically and that, that the, that is given to the patients and asked to describe. 
So, in this particular cookie theft, uh, this is actually um, the cookie theft picture, the cookie theft story picture, where and one can see how difficult it is uh, for the patient to actually say what is happening in the picture. So, there is a child who is trying to uh, steal cookies while his mother is busy washing uh, dishes and the uh, and the sink overflows with water and so on. So, this these uh, these uh, dots refer to the pauses in the speech the person has extreme difficulty the person suffering from Broca's aphasia has extreme difficulty producing word. So, it is labored it is lengthy and it takes a lot of time there is a lot of pauses and so on where verbal output average verbal output in a Broca's aphasic patient is very less. So, it is a slow labored and hesitant manner in which he speaks and also the rhythm and melody will be abnormal. Average number of words generated per minute is also greatly reduced because of the same difficulty in producing words and all sometimes they might also have a apraxia of speech which is resulted from disturbances to the high level of articulatory coordination and so on. So, basically Broca's aphasia affects the articulation the, the because this is affecting the motor cortex part of the motor cortex. So, the, there is a difficulty in producing speech. However, even though Broca's aphasia is associated with difficulty in speaking, there have been findings that even comprehension to some extent gets affected. So, the and similarly on the other hand Wernicke's aphasia will have will be um, uh, will affect the comprehension aspect primarily. However, there might be some other difficulties as well. So, because Broca's aphasics can uh, find it difficult to produce speech their fluency is affected it is called non fluent aphasia and because as we can see that there is a lot of difficulty there is a lot of time taken to speak the same uh, uh, simple sentence and so on. So, it is non fluent aphasia on the other hand Wernicke's aphasia is called fluent aphasia the reason being in case of Wernicke's aphasia the area that gets affected has nothing to do with the articulatory aspect of language. So, the person goes on sp speaking most of the time without any meaning to it. So, uh, let us see uh, this is an example of Wernicke's aphasia the this is called fluent aphasia because there is no dearth of uh, no dearth of um, output in, in case of in Wernicke's aphasia patient, but af as if you can if you just notice this there is hardly any meaning in it. So, in case of Wernicke's aphasics the comprehension aspect of language is severely affected and then but however, the fluency is not affected as a result of which we call this fluent aphasia or Wernicke's aphasia. Similarly, there are different other kinds of aphasias as well which we will see in the next lecture. Thank you.